Right, did you watch it last night? The first episode of um, ABC's Don't Stop the Music. Um, it, was on, it was on iView if you missed it, actually. But it was on last night on ABC television. And one of the, the stars of the show was the great expert on music education, Dr. Anita Collins. And thanks for coming in this morning so early to talk to me, Anita. Thank you so much for having me. I, there was all these incredible things that you were saying about the connection between music and the rest of education and in the development of children and I'll get onto that in a moment but first of all those diagrams I loved the diagrams mm. of the of the brain and what happens in the brain when somebody listens to music or learns music and yeah. I wanted to ask you more about it because I didn't quite catch it when I watched it <laughs> what were they <laughs> it, showing it's very complex well what we the reason why they started studying musicians is they looked at their brains when we were listening to music and there's a very famous story that they were working with the fMRI which is basically a very big uh, very very uh, expensive toy and they didn't quite so know it's what like to an do with MRI it. you go to the it is and it, but yeah. it watches the brain in real time. Oh. And so you can do things and you can see which bits of the brain light up at different times. I want one at home. They're pretty big, okay. quite noisy. Um, but they, they were sort of testing out what you could do with it. And they mm. got um, someone, they, all the scientists were sort of taking turns and they said, oh, listen to, read this or think about this or think about this colour, say, for example. And then they said, listen to music. And they, heard, they saw lights go off all over the, the brain scan to the point where they went, oh, no, we might have broken it. You know what? What's wrong? What the, we haven't seen Thinking this about before. Thinking how much it costs. I know. <laughs> and uh, what they then set, found was that music sets off huge numbers of networks and parts of the brain all at the same time, but at a very low level. And they said, "Wow, this is incredible. We've never seen anything like this." So this began the field of neuromusical research, which is to find out how the brain processes music, because music is. Uh, a very old part of our brain and so it has um, very wide networks and then they moved on to um, musically trained people first of all adults and then children because their brains seem to be working incredibly effectively and when they tested say a musically trained person and, and a non-musically trained person on the same task they found that the musically trained person was using less of their brain to do exactly the same task now oh. it basically means they're super efficient in the way that they do something and this is possible why we see musically trained people do well at a lot of other things they do well academically socially and they go on to do incredible things in their lives so this is why they they started studying that there's lots i want to pick up on on there so literally music is the only thing we know of that does those things to the brain yeah they've looked absolutely they've looked across lots and lots of other activities they've looked at chess they've looked at sport they've they've looked at all sorts of other things and other activities have parts of what music does but they haven't found anything that is as unique and as widespread as, as music learning is. And you said it was one of the oldest parts of the brain too. So when I think of the oldest parts of the brain, I think of the need to run away from predators, um, the need to reproduce, the need to yep. feed yourself, to hunt. We, is that what we're talking about? Kind of. They're the sort of basic needs of, of a human being. But if we think our brain didn't suddenly just pop out and, and be like it is now. We have had, we've over evolution, you know, we've developed different parts of our brain, but there's a very old part, which is the original part. And music sits, they think, and again, it's all, you know, it's all a new frontier for us in understanding this, that, that it, um, it sits in that oldest part. And the reason why we think that is because we use our music processing network to learn language. So we needed music before we could actually communicate and start to develop language as we have it today. And, and we see it in babies. Babies have a music processing network that they're born with that helps them to then learn how to speak and then how to read. And you said something in the in the program last night about the connection between kids who've had a supportive background at home and those who haven't, and mm. and they might have language that they've learnt and their exposure to music. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So... Uh, What's what we now know? What a lot of this research has done is looked at kids, you know, in really challenging circumstances because there's, they've seen that there's something about learning music which is sort of changing their brains because their brains literally are not as well developed as they could be and this is why we see academically that those kids really struggle at school and continue to struggle and it's because in their first sort of wiring of their brain it isn't sort of set up as, as effectively as it could be but when they have music programs in schools it seems to take care or improve some of these areas that aren't as well developed mm -hmm. one of which is auditory processing and auditory processing is how we learn language so uh, processing sound processing sound yeah and one of the most interesting things is that sound is our 
it's our most dominant sense, but we don't think it is. It collects the most amount of information from our surroundings mm -hmm. and it never, ever turns off. So it's even a, even on during our sleep, which is the, you know, wake up, there's a lion in my yes. cave. There's a reason why we've had it. <laughs> but we don't, time. we tend to think that, you know, we collect information through our eyes and that's the primary sense and then everything is the secondary sense. But our ears are actually the most important thing. But how often do we think about how the sound environment is affecting our mood, our learning, our everything about being human? And I think this research is starting to show us that we need to pay more attention to our ears. So here's the big question. What connections are there between learning music and development in a child? Okay. <laughs> so you'd like me to summarize things? Your, in, your whole know. life, basically. Exactly. No pressure. <laughs> Um, there's three big areas. The first one is language development. So the connection between music and language is um, automatic. So when we, we use music to learn language and the more we learn music, the better and quicker our language will develop. That's, that's the biggest one we have. The second area is uh, what's called executive function, which I like to call our grown-up skills. So it's, I don't have any <laughs> We try very hard at them. Right, yes. It's things like paying attention, being able to focus on things, uh, understanding our own emotional state, uh, understanding how someone else is feeling, planning, um, strategizing. It, it, it's, it's all those grown-up skills that we learn through school and they're learnt skills. We are not born with any of them. Mm -hmm. And we learn them through role modeling and we learn them um, through learning at school as well. But music sort of has all of those encapsulated in it as an activity. And so by learning music, you're kind of taking care of all of those. So that's the second one, executive mm -hmm. function. And it's, it, it's, it's my favorite one because in okay. the end, I think I'm not preparing a child to go out and be a musician in the school. I'm preparing a child to go out and be a happy, productive human being who can do whatever they want to. And that's executive function skills. Mm -hmm. And the final one is social skills. And they're not the social skills of please and thank you. These are the social skills of, of picking up the nuances um, when you're having a conversation with someone. When is it my turn to speak? Listening to someone going, do I really trust you? Mm. Um, hearing the nuances in, in language and actually having an emotional understanding of what's happening. Understanding what impact your the way you speak to somebody else has on that other person it's those very nuanced um very sought after social skills that that again if we've got highly developed as children we become really productive and happy and great human beings as adults so you seem to be describing um access and exposure to music as some kind of silver bullet for for kids I know that's an often used cliche, but um, <laughs> have you? What kind of skepticism have you heard from people when you you describe this to yeah, them? Yeah, yeah. I, I for me, it's really funny that silver bullet thing is often said, and and for me, there is no one silver bullet at all. It's actually a combination of of many many things. However, at the moment, we're missing the silver bullet in a way for all kids. We kind of have this this idea that music is for kids who, or music learning, is for kids who have a musical talent, and it's true they have absolutely identified that there are predispositions and talents in people. But that's to reach an incredibly high level. Mm. To learn a musical instrument, almost anybody can do it. Any child can do it and get the benefits from that. They don't have to go on and, you know, be part of the the Australian Chamber Orchestra. It's 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 about you know so it's a much chicken, bigger picture. So it's not chicken and egg here because no. look. You know, you, you talk about kids who, who are exposed to music, they do better in school. Isn't it the brighter kids who will learn music yeah. in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. And that's what the scientists looked at. They said, is it just the bright kids who are attracted to doing music and we're getting sort of skewed results? And they were very interested because if that was true, then all of the stuff they were seeing was null and void. Um, what they have found through doing randomised studies is that every child can benefit from having music education. And, every, and one of the scepticisms I often hear is, well... Kids should only, you know, do music if they're interested in it. And mm. I, for myself, I don't agree with that. I think every child is musical. Every child deserves to have access to music education because it's great for their musical and cognitive development. Um, if they wish to continue on in that line, great, we should support them. Um, but as long as we've actually ensured that their cognitive development is really sound, then it should be just like physical education. It should just be yeah. like literacy education. It's just a fundamental part of every child's development. Does music have a role to play in kids who have 
a more of a struggle in the classroom, you know, um, learning difficulties or mm. last night we saw Taj and he's got um, epilepsy. Yeah, extraordinary challenges for him, yeah. But but what role does music have to play for those kids? Yeah, well, music's, uh, music education in the form of therapy has been used for a very long time and interestingly enough, we're starting to see that all of this research is starting to um, shed some light on many of the issues um, that kids have in school and that teachers deal with with kids in schools, like, uh, like ADHD, dyslexia, um, ADD. You know, it's starting to help us understand how hearing and sound and sound processing is so important to all of those um, those sort of things that kids are dealing with. And um, music plays a really important role in doing that. Uh, in some cases, it's about finding a place where kids who don't fit in anywhere else in the school feel a sense of belonging. Mm-hmm. Um, in many cases, uh, it's about kids get attracted to doing music because it actually helps them with their sound processing. Um, I have a lot of kids, probably more than um, would be in the school, who are really interested in playing music who are autistic or on the spectrum. Oh. And they, because they struggle with hearing uh, the melody in uh, voice and being able to replicate that and actually have emotion in voice. And we know someone um, when we meet them who is autistic by their, their speech patterns. Yeah. And so a lot of them seem to be extremely attracted to learning music, maybe possibly because it's helping them learn that particular skill. So it has an absolute place for every child and can have benefits for kids who are developmentally delayed or are struggling with their learning, as well as kids who are absolutely normal and wonderful and have had you know, uh, all the necessary ingredients to make for a great upbringing. Um, we were talking about kids from, you know, who are disadvantaged in physically or have disorders, but there's uh, there's other disadvantage too. And like, the big thing I took away from last night was the, the school in Armdale Chalice. It's a lovely school, very well run. The teachers are awesome. But, mm. you know, it's not a great socioeconomic area, is it? And what role does music have to play for, for those kids who maybe don't have the best life at home, et cetera. Yeah. So those three, the things I mentioned before, language and executive function and social skills are absolutely the three areas where kids who grow up in disadvantage are struggling. Um, As as you heard last night, um, the commonly used statistic is that uh, kids who grow up in disadvantage hear 30 million less words by the time they're five. And that's 30 million less inputs into their brain to understand how language works. So they're already behind um executive function is an as a learnt skill and is something that we learn through role modeling particularly from our parents and and our community um kids who grow up in disadvantage may not have the most consistent role models in terms of executive function for that and again in social skills you know that that nuance of of dealing with so many things they're dealing with and a lot of these kids would be classified as living in trauma you know, yeah. not knowing where breakfast is coming from, not knowing where you're sleeping tonight, not knowing, not having a desk at home um, in which you can sit down and you know you you can do your homework. You know, these all these things affect brain development. So music has this incredible way of addressing those three very fundamental areas, um, giving the kids confidence, helping their auditory process for language, modelling executive function, but in a social situation, mm-hmm. which is the strongest way to actually do it, um, and getting them to realise their impact on their peers and how their peers impact on them with their, their social skills. So it all wrapped up in one, it is an incredible activity for developing those areas that kids who grow up in disadvantage really struggle with. I've got a couple of practical questions for you, Anita. Um, mm-hmm. I was really inspired by um, the teacher, Simon Blanchard from Chalice, um, mm. really threw himself in at the, the deep end. Um, not as a primary school teacher, not especially trained in music, but he decided to become the music teacher, and it was quite—it's been quite a journey for him. I'm only seen mm. episode one, but it's quite a journey for him to to learn how to teach music. And I was just wondering if I, I imagine a lot of people listening to to you and I chatting will be teachers, mm. and I'm wondering if you've got any advice for them if they're in that same situation. What what the first step is? I think a lot of. It's it's incredibly complex. I think a lot of the issue comes with that we don't have a huge amount of time in our pre-service teacher education to learn how to teach music. And we have this situation where generalist teachers in primary school are expected to teach the five arts areas. Now, we have specialists who can't teach the five yes. arts areas. Why are we asking generalists to do it? And then we're only giving them somewhere between four and 17 hours in an entire four-year degree to do that. So I think if you're a teacher in school and you've 
had musical background yourself, that's a great place to start. But then going and getting professional learning that's supported by your school to say, I want to be a more of a specialist teacher. And then looking at making sure that you go to a program um, that's an ongoing program that makes sure that you see, builds your skills. One of the things we see with Simon, who is an absolute legend, yes. um, is that he first of all realises um, that he doesn't know what he doesn't know. Mm. And that in itself is a very big step but also quite frightening. But he's willing to jump in and actually learn just like his students do. And that I think is the best thing. It takes time, it takes years to do, but when you commit to it and you have support in your school and from your leadership, then you can develop into a music specialist as well. And you really believe in the benefits of it, I yep, suppose. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and connected with that, you know, look, um, the teacher of the school, that's only part of the puzzle. Um, what mm. goes on at home? Um, it could be tough. Can't it? I mean, I learned the tuba. My sister was learning it at the same time. We sounded like a oh wow. Yeah, there was some <laughs> kind of cattle thing going on in our house, and it must have been a nightmare for my parents. Um, what what advice do you have you got for parents, particularly those who who didn't didn't learn instruments themselves? Mm, yeah. Well, the first shock that comes for a parent is when a musical instrument comes home and the kids play their first note, and it's horrible. It will be nothing short of horrible and that's exactly what it should be. Playing a musical instrument takes years to learn and this we also always have to remember to parents it's you're bringing an instrument home that's coming into your lounge room and, in, in, you know, having an impact on your home life. But in saying that, the benefit of having a space in the home for kids to practice, even if it's just here's the music space, it's a little mat and here's a music stand and that's the place where you practice. Practicing for, you know, 10 minutes every single day at the start is absolutely perfect mm. and being aware as parents of our reactions when they do hit a really 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 horrible note if we flinch and then we're in there it's you know line of sight or if we go oh that didn't sound very good that has a massive impact on the kids with their development because they're trying really hard they're going to get it wrong way more than they get it right and that is actually the power of the process the power is to say you can persist and just keep going and going and going you will get it mm -hmm. and our job as parents is is um just as important as the teachers at the school and the school leadership because really music is the thing that goes between home and school and we all have to be, be part of supporting that student to do it, particularly when it gets frustrating and they go, I'm not having fun anymore, I want to give up, yeah. which I'm sure there are parents out there who've heard that. The to, parents say that or the kids say that? Well, sometimes I wonder if... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't really want Are the trumpet sure in my lounge room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but part of it is to say, and we often say, oh, well, you're not having fun it's meant to be fun, so it's okay if you give up, mm. which totally makes sense. However, I sit there and ask the question, what message is that sending to our kids? When something gets hard, it's okay to give it up? And I don't think that's a message we want to send. And I really encourage parents to say, you know, when they say that to you, great, fantastic. Do you know how much your brain's growing right now? It's <laughs> yes. doing something really hard and it's figuring out how to get past it. Keep going at it. And for kids who even one comment is the difference between, you know, giving up and keeping going and the parent is the most important person to give that comment, that will be a turning point in not just their musical development but in your relationship with your child. So you, you, you set out your stall in this three-part series and I'm looking forward to seeing episode two and three that every, every kid, no matter their background, should have access to music education and... It's starting um, the, the Don't Stop the Music campaign, which means the people like you and me go and look in the garage and find the old <laughs> instruments that are still in working order but haven't been touched for a while and mm. take them down to the salvos and get those instruments. The salvos will get those instruments to the kids, like the, the, the likes of which we saw on the TV show that would love to learn music um, but never in a million years would have access to a musical instrument. So with all those pieces in place, um, what's your dream for music education moving forward after this? Yeah, my dream would be that in five years' time we look across Australia and every single child in a primary school has an ongoing sequential music education for at least two years, if not more. 
uh, that includes singing and learning a musical instrument and that those programs are being delivered by confident and qualified music educators, whether they be generalists who have upskilled or specialist music teachers, uh, and that it is done in such a way that we can start to see the results in in those measures that, say, politicians might be interested in, like in NAPLAN and, and you know, sort of how, how the schools, the wellbeing within the schools, all of that sort of stuff can be seen. And it will take a long time. And it will take the leadership of people in schools, it will take the leadership of music teachers, it will take the leadership of parents. Um, But most of all, I want to see kids having exactly what they deserve and need, which is a powerful music education to set them up for life. Well, I certainly hope you're right. And it (laughs) it all begins here, doesn't it? It does. Thank you, Anita. Thank you.